gastroenterology and gastroenterology at uh, UCL and um, has really been a pioneer in researching um, and taking things forward from an endoscopic ultrasound and pancreatology point of view. And um, he's been running studies now for a long time on introducing radiofrequency ablation treatment, which we've been very used to treating uh, the liver in the past, but now we're going to move uh, towards uh, treating lesions in the pancreas. And he's uh, set up a number of trials, which he's going to uh, give us some uh, insight to now. So, Steve, thanks for joining us. Sorry it's a bit late, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, we'll get you sorted out. Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks to everybody for uh, asking me to talk on new endocrine tumors, and is it time to start ablating? Um, I won't give the answer yet, but I will in the last slide, okay? So, as you know, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours uh, are really managed uh, surgically. Uh, generally, they're rare conditions, 5% of pancreatic resections, often young patients with long-standing symptoms. They're clinically complex in terms of functioning and non-functioning tumours. Uh, they're occasionally very small and difficult to locate, and they go through many different uh, investigations. And surgically, it's an issue because there's a healthy, soft pancreas. It's difficult to anastomose. There's uh, pancreatic leaks, which is more common than in cancer operations. And there's a heterogeneous grade of malignancy. So and clinically, uh, we're talking about patients with non-functioning tumors uh, in the majority, 85% or so, uh, and those with uh, functioning tumors. The ones we often see are people with insulinoma, hyperinsulinism causing symptoms. And some are associated with genetic syndromes that we see, uh, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome and MEN1. So here's the uh, European neuroendocrine guidelines, um, which I can just see. So I think in terms of a radio frequency ablation, we're really talking about tumors less than two centimeters in size. So patients who are presenting uh, clinically with non-functioning or occasionally functioning lesions, who would, who would not generally be considered for surgery un until the lesion is two centimeters in size or causing symptoms, although that is a subject of the Aspen study, which aims to recruit a thousand patients uh, with tumors less than two centimeters and looking at the natural history of those patients led by uh, Professor Massimo Falcone, and that'll be reporting, I think, in 2023. So there may be a role for non-surgical approaches in some patients in that group at the top center, tumors less than two centimeters, non-functioning, perhaps grade one in histology, occasionally uh, with symptoms like insulinomas. We'll come to that. So to understand who we should be ablating, I think uh, I try to understand who should be getting surgery. And uh, you know, I think the surgical strategy is very clear uh, in terms of the European guidelines and our practice, uh, certainly at the Royal Free, which is a the European uh, Net Center. Um, and that really depends on the likelihood of malignancy, the size and number and location of lesions, whether it's intrapancreatic or intraduodenal, et cetera. Um, and is there any evidence of local extension, liver metastasis, et cetera. And that, those would clearly be exclusion criteria generally for US approaches. And there's lots of different surgical approaches. And I don't claim to have spent any time in theaters for at least 20 or 30 years. Um, but uh, Parenchymal sparing nucleation is occasionally done, but more commonly duodenopancreatectomy for head lesions and left pancreatectomies or, or extended left pancreatectomies for uh, tail body lesions, and obviously other surgical approaches depending on tumor load. So in terms of tumor ablation by endoscopic ultrasound, lots of different approaches. Um, and just going through, we have we have used PDT in the past. Um, Paolo Chiriacano in Milan has reported on a gas-cooled uh, RFA ablation devices, triathermal ablation, and RFA, of course. In terms of just to uh, flag up PDT, we've been through those, and Matt Huggett was our previous speaker. He, he published on uh, in CT-guided PDT for pancreatic lesions, and just in the last two weeks at the bottom right there, after having gone through blue tract tumors uh, and using nanoliposomes in animal models, the uh, BIRDPAC2 study has just been published, and that was a small series proof of principle of eight patients having EUS guided PDT for pancreatic cancer with response in five patients. So, but generally um, a laborious approach, uh, it's expensive. Uh, the studies are very small and haven't changed clinical practice. And our main UK study, which was a defining study was a negative one. So there's no benefit for PDT in biliary tract cancer. So there's no uh, work that I know of undergoing this in new endocrine tumors at present. What about radiofrequency ablation? Um, 
this is the approach. It's simple. Uh, we're all kind of getting used to it. And as, as Andy had said, it's been used in the radiological field for many, many years. Uh, the approach, of course, is to place a needle into the lesion and provide heat. And there were two, but now one uh, uh, needle, the Habib needle uh, down there, which we, I think we reported the first case in the UK in 2016 of an insulinoma there. And that may even, yes, that's, that's going. So this is the Habib probe has now been removed. Uh, it's, it's, it's undergoing uh, re new manufacturing techniques. That's not available to us anymore. And that was a slow uh, ablation process over 90 seconds. You can see the electrical interference there at the bottom. So the one that people are using around the world at the moment is the uh, StarMed uh, device with Tai Wong. Comes in 19 gauge, um, energy delivered at the tip. There's different lengths of uh, fiber. I use a five millimeter and a 10 or a 10 millimeter. It has an internal cooling sheath. So ice cold uh, uh, saline is, 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 is glued through the inside of the sheath. Uh, the generator is a specific StarMed generator. And depending on the length of the uh, needle, I use 50, either 15 or 30 watts. And uh, it measures impedance, and you can look at that and then stop that when the impedance starts rising, indicating that you've got high temperatures generally, or more commonly now, just looking at microbubbling. And this is a very fast technique. So generally 10 to 15 seconds, and you'll see um, quite marked effects around the needle and stop and then, and then change position. So what's the data? And, you know, I have... Uh, there's, there's plenty of uh, small series of a few patients, and this is the best data we have out there, and I've just concentrated on this. This is the French multi-center uh, study published in endoscopy in 2019 of EUS-guided RFA using the Taiwan device. Um, concentrating on just the new endocrine tumors, you see it was a mixed uh, population of cystic tumors and new endocrine tumors. 12 patients had 14 nets. These were all non-functioning with a median size, as you see, of... 30 millimeters and all under the 20 millimeter cutoff generally for surgery. And they were mixed in terms of position. So the objective was to look at safety and they had three complications early on actually. The first patient had pan pancreatitis, one delayed perforation, one pancreatic duct stenosis, and they modified the protocol to include uh, prophylactic NSAIDs, uh, extrapolating from the ERCP data to give antibiotics for patients and uh, with the cystic tumors, obviously to minimize residual fluid content, not relevant to neuroendocrine tumors. Although one patient had cystic, uh, had a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. So their uh, complication rate overall with this approach was 3.5%. 20% of patients had mild postoperative pain. So the largest series so far, but still only about 30 patients. But here's the outcome data for the neuroendocrine tumors. So again, 12 patients with 14 nets. Um, a significant response in terms of size reduction uh, at 12 months, uh, with 12 of 14 uh, showing either disappearance or significant necrosis, two patients uh, no effect, and one patient uh, had some size increase. So these are data which was subsequently presented uh, as an abstract last year. At 33 months, though, uh, the complete response had risen to 93%. Presumably because some of the patients assessed at 12 months still had residual necrosis rather than uh, active tissue. So reassuring, 3% complication rate, 90% uh, ablation rate, at, as, at least as of follow-up in terms of 33 months so far. And you know, compare that with the potential complications with surgical procedures. So here, here they are from, uh, from Whipple's procedure, so mortality. Uh, one to three percent, depending on age and comorbidity of the patient. Uh, morbidity of twenty to forty percent. So obviously, um, it's a big operation with significant morbidity. In, in comparison, uh, you know, patients who with a left-sided lesion have approaches in terms of laparoscopic approaches. So uh, some some of the surgeons are now doing robotic surgery and certainly laparoscopic surgery, particularly for distal pancreatectomy. There's also been reported uh, patients having a full pancreatic duodenectomy robotically, which is a understand a long procedure, but feasible. And then uh, these are the complication rates for a surgical distal pancreatectomy. So very safe procedure in terms of mortality, um, often spleen preserving, but not always. Again, with morbidity higher than what you've seen in that small series with EUS guided radio frequency ablation. And then finally, uh, here's the is the role of laparoscopic versus open pancreatic resection. This is a meta-analysis from our group. 
um, Brian Davidson and Andrea Filling from, um, from Hammersmith, um, basically showing that laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy is equivalent to open pancreatectomy intensive outcome, but as you'd expect, uh, a lower complication rate with laparoscopic approaches and a shorter length of stay compared with open surgery. So if we're doing, if we're doing studies with endoscopic ultrasound radiofrequency ablation, this is probably the standard that we should be comparing uh, outcome data with rather than with a major uh, open operation. So I've just gone through that quite quickly. Uh, things are changing a little bit. You know, I think uh, I'll show you my last slide where I think uh, radio frequency ablation in neuroendocrine tumors fits in at the moment. Um, this was a patient who was referred to me just uh, six weeks ago, 56 years of age, a recurrent hypoglycemia over the last 12 months, um, which have been pretty disabling for her and had put her in danger a few times in terms of falling in the street and driving before she was diagnosed. She'd been through a whole range of investigations over the previous 12 months, including uh, a good quality triphasic CT, gadolinium enhanced MR pancreas, um, and obviously uh, Octate's uh, PET, all being negative. And my former trainee, uh, George Goodchild, who's now a local consultant, uh, found a six by seven millimeter insulinoma in the body of the pancreas, uh, which he confirmed on an EOS guided biopsy. So this uh, patient went to uh, the HPB MDT at that hospital. Um, and the outcome, uh, which, which would probably be up for discussion, was, was to uh, send this patient to me for ablation. And you can see the picture on the bottom right. It's a seven millimeter lesion. It's sitting next to the descending aorta. Um, at seven o'clock is the splenic vein. And at, uh, you know, just, at, uh, just to, to the right is the splenic artery. So quite a small window and quite a few vascular structures around there, which uh, endoscopists are not used to stopping if they start bleeding. But it, nevertheless, she went on to have uh, an EOS RFA uh, after much discussion, uh, and according to the patient's and the surgeon's wishes, on the 26th of February, um, which is not very far, that should be the 26th of January, actually. So, and then since then, I had a CT the day after, which we do as a check, uh, according to our other trials as well. I had a visible ablation zone now, um, and, and six weeks later, she remains well and asymptomatic, and we'll have a follow-up gadolinium MR for its worth in six months' time. So, you know, there's not very much data out there in terms of EOS guided radio frequency ablation. We can certainly discuss about other indications for RFA emerging in the EOS literature. You know, overall, they're all small series by large enthusiasts. There's that study, the French model center study is a small number of patients. There are two further studies on clinicaltrials.gov at present. There's another French multi center study being set up, um, due to, which was due to start in December 2020. And that's uh, again, using EOS guided RFA in patients with non-functioning tumors, less than two centimeters. And Alberti Laghi's, Alberti Laghi's uh, study, the Rapnin study uh, from Rome, which is a a European registry, again, of patients with either non-functioning or functioning neuroendocrine tumors, which are under two centimeters, or in whom surgery is not possible or desired. So, so far, you know, the data out there supports its use in, for example, small instantomas. I showed you, showed you one there and of the previous patient in 2016 and some other experience. Uh, we need to look at small lesions. It's very hard to ablate lesions greater than two centimeters with the current technology we have. Um, we don't want to be tackling patients with high grade lesions, of course, in whom surgery should always remain a gold standard. So we're looking at G1, maybe low G2, grade two non-functioning nets. Um, but in general, I think the data so far, it's only occasionally time to start ablating and only after discussion in the multidisciplinary team meeting context. And we need some better quality data to define its role compared with surveillance and ongoing minimally invasive surgery. So I'll stop there and thanks very much for everybody's attention. Steve, th thank you very much. And I, I know you've got to go soon, but the, um, I think right. uh, I'm, a, I'm a, I, th I think we're really keen to get this technology in the standard really, especially for neuroendocrine tumors, because um, there's, we're committing people to an awful lot and, with, and they're, they're being found, you know, C CT and MR is, is finding these lesions now and they're being identified, they're causing worry. And without um, having to put patients through major surgery, we can biopsy them um, and we can predict response. Uh, do you think this is something we should be using much more for those, especially for those lesions less than two centimeters from your endocrine tumors? 
Yeah, so um, I was going to show another patient who was, you know, 35 years of age who I saw just some months ago with an insulinoma in the head of the pancreas. Um, and he went through the same uh, workup and went on to have a full open pancreatic duodenectomy. So, you know, it's possible that uh, he would have a similar outcome with an insulinoma with the minimum invasive EUS guided radiofrequency ablation with one treatment. And also we have the option with RFA of going back and ablating, you know, any small occurrence. And again, uh, people around the world, uh, including myself, have had some experience with that. So with other types of uh, functioning tumors, I think surgery is the standard. With non-functioning lesions, I, th I think we need more data about the safety. We have some data, so it looks pretty safe, uh, but also the natural history of the of non-functioning nets. And I think the Aspen study will be an important contribution to the literature in a couple of years' time. Okay. Steve, thanks very much for your time. I hope you're going to get out on one of those bikes behind you later on as well, because they look great. <laughs> okay, nice. mate. <laughs> all right, buddy. Okay, all right, Steve. Thanks very much. We'll let yeah. you go now, and, yeah. um, and uh, all the best. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so this is the last.